tell people, like the weekly email updates. Are All right, good evening. My name is Tracy. I'll be moderating tonight's meeting. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, as you know, this meeting is being held by Ford. We also have the water board in attendance, and it's to dis discuss the installation of a soil vapor extraction system. Um, at Belcourt Terrace, and so we'll go through all of the specifics of what that will look like, potential impacts, and most importantly, we'll answer your questions and give you any information you feel you might be missing. Um, first of all, I want to, you see our, oh, we don't see our agenda. Sarah, can you move that forward for me, or you're doing it, okay. Thanks, so here's our agenda. It's about a 30-minute agenda, and then we'll save plenty of time for questions and answers. If you have questions that are specific to your property, um, I'd like to ask you to hold those questions, and we will talk with you afterwards. But if you have a general question or a clarifying question, feel free to ask it during the presentation. I think, yeah, yeah why not? Not a problem. Um, just one thing I do want to note, we are tape recording this for people that couldn't attend it. And so if you, ask, if you do want to ask a question, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand. I know this is kind of silly. And then Sarah will walk over and give you the microphone, and we'd like you to speak clearly in the microphone so that people that watch this later on um, can hear that question. And if you don't do that, then I'll just go ahead and repeat the question before we answer it. So anybody that watches it at a later date can get the whole picture of what we're talking about. Um, really quickly, I'd like to do some quick introductions, and then I'm going to hand this over to Mike Barnes, I think. So going in order here, I think most people know Emily. Emily is the field representative and also an engineer, right? And then Mike Barnes is the program manager for WSP, which is the environmental consultant that Ford has. And then, of course, we all know Jessica Law. She's been leading this project for, what, seven years, eight years? Something like that. A long time. Since yeah, she's been leading a long time. Um, and we're very fortunate to have her, I have to say. And then over here, we have a couple new people. This is Susan Robello. Did I say that? Rebellion. She's an engineer, and she's also the construction service she, construction manager, and she does all the oversight of construction, but she's not actually in the field. This is Dong Zhu, and he is Dong. I don't know what you do, so why don't you <laughs> go ahead and tell us. Um, I'm a field engineer, and then uh, I'll be overseeing the construction for uh, P10 Bay Ridge uh, Park community. And then I'm Natalie Young. I'm also an engineer, and I'll be helping oversee this P11 construction. So lots of qualified people to oversee this. And then in the far back, I just want to note, here's um, Ken Connor. And Ken is with WSP, and he runs the Northern California operations now. Um, and I don't believe Ken has ever missed a meeting, if I'm not mistaken. It's been at every single meeting we've had. So with that, any questions or Concerns? Okay, so I think everybody got the huge booklet of slides that we gave you. Um, there's food out here. The restrooms are out in the hallway and to the left. And I think that should do it. So I'm going to hand this over to Mike and Great. go through. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tracy. Appreciate it. And just point of clar clarification, we call you all P11. Uh, P10 is Bay Ridge Park. P11, parcel 11, is Belcourt Terrace. And Belcourt Master coming in on Belcourt Drive is... P12. So if you hear us say P10, P11, P12, that's what we're talking about. But I'll refer to you all as Belcourt Terrace today. So thank you for coming tonight. I know your time is valuable. Um, this is a long presentation or a lot of slides. I'll try to get through it as quick as I can, but this is one of the most important meetings we've had because this is where we actually start the SVE construction, which is the cleanup of the issue beneath, beneath your property. Um, so. I'm going to talk about uh, introductions. I'll go through brief introductions. Again, we're going to have a project overview. Uh, we're going to talk about the schedule. Um, we're going to talk about construction workflow, and that's where we're going to get into the specifics of what you're going to see in what phases in a, basically a step-by-step -step process. And then I'm going to talk about communication and preparedness, how we're going to communicate with you as a community to make sure you have all the information as real time as we can get to you. And I'll go through that in detail. Um, and then we'll have question and answers. And then if you have, again, if you have a specific question regarding your property, happy to answer that at the end. Um, but in the interest of time, I'd like to try to get through this presentation as quickly as we can. We can walk over to the poster boards afterwards, point out your particular property, and talk about the impacts and when you might see impacts there. Okay. So we've all gone through introductions. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide, but I do wanna show one picture that I took yesterday, because these are the faces you're gonna see. 
So um, in addition to everybody in this room, for the most part, we have our construction uh, company, e, e which is a great group of gentlemen um, that'll be working on the site. So these are actually the people that you're going to see in your community. Um, they are over at Bay Ridge Park um, right now doing work. So the, the Bay Ridge Park and Belcourt Terrace SVE construction are gonna be going on simultaneously. All right, and everybody knows the key stakeholders. We've got Jessica Law, we've got Ford is the responsible party, and underneath Ford we have WSP, that's me. Uh, we have Craig Communications, and then E&E &E is our uh, main contractor. And then we have H2K Technologies, which is actually building the treatment system and the building that it goes in, which I'll talk about more as we move forward. And then we have Greg Drilling. They're a drilling company that are gonna be installing the extraction wells, and that's where we extract the vapors out, and I'll talk about that more as we go on. All right, so let's talk about the project. The next two slides, and I'm gonna assume that most people are pretty familiar with the history of the site and why we are here today. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip by these two slides and set, unless there's somebody new here that has no idea what we're, what we're talking about and why we're here, but these are gonna be in the presentation, they're in your handout and they'll be online. So again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through these. But this one just basically tells you the basics of vapor intrusion. Happy to discuss them after the meeting too, if you have questions. So let's talk about soil vapor extraction. So quickly as a refresher, and this is one I do wanna uh, go over, and you've seen this before, is what is soil vapor extraction? So as you can see in this rendering, we have the groundwater table, which is at the very bottom of this rendering. That is the source of the contamination. Previous concentrations of these chemicals of concern were in groundwater, they volatilize, and then they make their way up through preferential pathways, the pockets between soil, and they can potentially enter your home. There, the groundwater concentrations, or the chemicals of concern concentrations in groundwater now are low. So it's, the groundwater is no longer a source. The best way to think about it is, are these chemicals are held up in the soil. And so again, they can make their way underneath somebody's house and then follow a preferential, a potential preferential pathway into the home, such as a crack in the foundation, something of that nature. So what we're looking at here is an above ground treatment system. This is very similar to what you're gonna have placed in, in Belcourt Terrace. It's the best way to think about this is it's a large vacuum inside a building that has a s network of subterranean pipes that go into vertical pipes that then extract the soil vapors out of the soil. So they remove the contamination. Right, this is a removal, this is remediation, they clean it up. And I'm gonna turn, Emily and I are gonna kinda go back and forth. Um, Emily is one of the lead engineer design, uh, in charge of design, and also our community liaison, and I'm gonna talk about that more, but I'm gonna turn it over to Emily to talk briefly about this slide and what these circles represent and how it relates to the construction of the system. So yeah, here we have uh, the whole, system that will be installed in Belcourt Terrace. There are eight extraction wells. Um, so, okay. Um, eight soil vapor extraction wells that'll go around, they're the green dots up there. And then the orange circles show the radius of influence of each of those wells. So um, based on previous modeling, we did a pilot study over in Bay Ridge Park, um, kind of closest on the in the area closest to um, Belcourt Terrace that we've used for modeling the entire site. And um, it showed that the radius of influence of each well could be about 100 feet. So that's what we're assuming here for our design. And that's what those orange circles show. It's 100 feet from the center of each well. Uh, so that's what's going to be pulling air. And those Green lines, like curvy green lines going around show the concentrations. It's hard to see um, from this viewpoint. But um, so yeah, all of the wells are within the highest concentration areas of the soil vapor um, chemicals. And this is, so we're, we're covering that whole area where homes, and we got our circles as close to the homes as possible to be able to, um, cover the entire foundation. Good. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so here are some primary um, construction components. So we have the soil vapor extraction, well installation, and I'm gonna talk in detail about each of these on an individual slide, but those are the extraction points, the vertical wells that go down, 
40, 45, feet. 45 feet or so below ground surface to extract those chemicals. And then we have the trenching and pipe laying, as you see, and you'll see additional pictures moving forward in this presentation. Um, you see a rendering here showing the layout of what the trenching will look like to the bottom left. Um, and then we have a horizontal drilling component to this underneath Country Club Drive because we are getting a power source from Belcourt Master into Belcourt Terrace, but then we're also continu continuing just the electrical conduit to Bay Ridge Park to feed that treatment system. So there is a horizontal drilling component to this that will go underneath Country Club Drive. And then there's going to be the treatment system and building placement, and I know that's the one thing that everybody wants to talk about. I will show you pictures of what, renderings of what it will look like, and we'll talk in detail about that process. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have a power connection coming from Belcourt Master. All right, so schedule. Um, so today, we're having our pre-construction SBE uh, meeting. Um, we did receive our building permit. Well, we haven't received it, but we received approval. We're picking up hard copies sometime this week, so that is a huge milestone for us that we have approval to start all of the work. Um, and then we have, we're going to pr be performing pre-construction -construct activities, which will be about two weeks, which are going to start on February 5th. I like to think of this as the soft start. This is where we're mobilizing to the site, and I'll talk again about this in more detail on, on upcoming slides, but this is kind of the soft start start for two weeks where we're mar marking out locations, we're setting up our staging areas, we're getting, we're mobilizing to the site. The heavier work will start on February 19th, and I'll go into more detail about that. And then kind of a subsection of this is the in installation of those wells. Um, that is scheduled with our driller, and that's going to occur in a separate phase from March 11th through the 20th, and we'll talk more about that in a future slide. And then we have the trench, which is where we're going to bury the um, subterranean piping that goes to the extraction wells that will then ultimately tie back into the treatment building to treat the vapors. And then we have the installation of the treatment building itself, which is going to be a couple different phases, which we'll talk about. And then we have the testing and startup. And right now on our schedule, it's, it's scheduled to start up on July 23rd. This is construction. And one of the things that you've noticed is I've committed to two dates. I've committed to February 5th, well, actually three dates, February 5th, March 11th through the 20th, and February 19th. Once we get done with certain aspects of the project, we moved into a phased approach of where we'll be working in specific phases. A slide will come up to explain that. But construction is construction, and we don't want to commit to a specific date here. But what's very important is you all will be, will be receiving weekly email updates with a uh, introductory paragraph, it'll tell you what work has been done that week, and it'll have a two-week look, look ahead. That's where you're going to really get the details of your schedule and when we'll be coming into your neighborhood or in, in front of your home. All right, so let's talk again about workflow or the step-by-step -step process. So one, we assess site conditions pre-construction, We and we'll do this post-construction as well. Uh, step two is we mobilize to the site, we mark the trench and all of the system locations, and we perform utility clearance. We don't want to hit anything, any of the subterranean utilities like gas, electric, phone, things like that. Then we're going to go into the saw cutting of the entire trench system um, and the system locations, and then we'll go into an exercise called potholing the utilities to confirm the existence of those, pot of, of those utilities. Then we go into the SVE well installations, and each one of these steps has an upcoming slide. Um, then we go into trench, trench excavation, um, system installation, and restoration, and we have six phases to that. Um, then we have the treatment system building installation, and then again, we have the SVE startup. All right, so assessing site conditions. One of the things we did before we started construction activities, we went out with a 360 degree optical device, which takes basically like Google Street View, if anybody's played around with that. It takes pictures in a 360 degree range of every location that you see with a red circle on it. So the reason we do this is that we return your community back to the way it was, if not better, when we're done. So we want to be, and this is a useful tool for us over the phone to talk about a particular area. When, when we're trying to look into things. So you can click on a particular circle, it brings up that image, and then we can do a 360 degree view of, of that area we're working in. And that'll be done at the end as well. All right, step two, mobilize the site and mark trench system locations. So what's nice is we have a head start. I'm gonna pause a second. 
and we have been constructing an SVE system over at Bay Ridge Park since November. And so these pictures are actually from Bay Ridge Park to give you an idea. They're not renderings, they're not examples. These are actually the crews, the equipment that you're gonna be seeing at your particular HOA. And so what you're seeing here, and this is that first two weeks of work that I talked about. Um, we're gonna construct a lay down area and I'll show you where that's gonna be coming up. That's gonna be temporary area where we, have some of the, where we stage some of the equipment. The larger trucks and certain things, those will all be removed off site and we'll talk about a typical work day and what it'll look like at the beginning, during, and after each day. And then we're gonna mark that trench system, basically the, the layout of the SVE system. So they're gonna come out with white paint, they're gonna mark that, they're gonna call in our utility locators, the utility locators are gonna come out and that's you know, SoCal Edison, that's your gas company, all of those people come out and they mark their utilities. Then what we're gonna do is saw cut the entire length of the trench. And the reason we do this is because this is one of the noisier components to the work. And we'd rather get it all out of the way ahead of time rather than every week or every two weeks, here comes that noisy saw cutter again. So this saw cutting, as you see in the top, is a two-man crew. They cut basically the line of the trench. The saw cut will remain there. You can walk over it, you can drive over it, but the entire length will be saw cut so that they can come back in a phased approach, remove that asphalt, excavate the soil, and install sections of the treatment system, again, in a phased approach. In addition to the saw cutting, we're gonna do what's called potholing. Potholing is, ex is confirming the existence of these utilities, because we do not wanna hit anything, and so what they do is what's called air knifing. So, they take a combination of high pressure air and a vacuum. They remove the soil and vacuum it out while they're trying to locate that utility. They find the utility. The air doesn't damage the utility. They find the utility, they survey the utility, and then they fill that, backfill that hole, hole. They'll do what's called a cold patch on top of that. That way we know exactly where the utility is so when they start the excavation project, we know we need to make a detour around here or we can go through here and we know it's there. And I'll add to that that potholing is also, those are the two loudest activities we have right here. So that's why we're kind of front loading all of that. So it's all out of the way for the entire community right at the beginning. All right, and this is kind of that subcomponent of the SVE well installations. We could do this at a variety of times, but we've picked March 11th to 12th, uh, through the 20th. Um, any dates that I mention do not include weekend work or holidays. Um, and you'll pr be provided advanced notification of when we'll be installing wells in front of these particular homes. So here's what you will see as far as a typical drill rig. Um, that's the drill rig is with the mast, basically goes down, excavates soil, we install the well, um, and then they have a well completion at the top in the form of a well box. So each one of these green circles represents a location of an extraction well, which correlates to the radius of influence that Emily was talking about. And in future slides, I'm gonna talk about why these are on those grassy areas in front of your home or in a landscaped area. It's because we need to get as close to the foundation as we can. Every foot is important because of that radius of influence. All right, so here is the trenched phased approach that I talk about. So if you look at this figure, what we're gonna have Oh yeah, it's working. It was. So what we are gonna have is the saw cutting is gonna occur the entire length of all these different colors that you see and the potholing. So that's that first two weeks where we're getting all of that work out of the way. Then we fall into what's called our phased approach. We're gonna work in these sections in phases. So we're gonna start in phase one, which is essentially just the power drop and we're working with Belcourt Master and we're communicating with them similar to the ways we're communicating with you all. Um, but they're just not as impacted as you all are. Um, so that's where the transformer pad will be laid. That's where SCE will come in and drop our transformer and that is the electrical conduit that will feed both, both the treatment systems. When we get into, let me turn it over. I'll take a break and turn it over to you about the phased approach. Sure, yeah. So yeah, when we start, Working in the phased approach, we will, it'll be about 400 feet at a time. Um, that's what we're calling a phase. But then during any given day, uh, only 200 feet will be open at any one time maximum. 
Um, they'll have trench plates over that whole 400 foot section so that if they need to go bounce back and forth a little bit from day to day, they can. Um, but yeah, so th we will send out notifications a week before each of these phases starts. So if you're in phase two, you'll get an email specifically to those people in that phase um, saying we're starting work. Uh, next week in your area and then you'll also get a phone call and we'll talk more about all of the notifications at the end but um, that's it's how that's how it's gonna go it's gonna go in chunks um, around starting from Belcourt and going south first and we're going south first so that we can get that electrical connection out of the way and then we'll come back around um, and do the connection to the treatment system building um, at the closer to the end and then also the connections to each of the wells uh, it might be kind of phased differently if if we're going to be in front of your home to make a connection to one of the wells we'll, we'll give you advance notice um, but we have that separated as phase six so that we can focus on the main line but there might be times where it makes sense for us to come and um, start some of those in between. So we'll, we'll keep everyone up to date on that. And same with the connection over to Belcourt or Bay Ridge Park, um, that horizontal drilling. It's not really, it doesn't necessarily have to be phased in in the same way. Um, it's kind of its own separate mobilization of another crew. So we're trying to figure out when that makes most sense to, to mm -hmm. have go on and we'll let the people in that area know about it ahead of time. Yeah. Did you have a question, George? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Mike, I'm going to ask you to repeat that question. Just to Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, George's you. question was, when you're working in front of somebody's home and there's an excavation in front and they need to pull their car out, how much advance notification, how will that communication occur? And I have an actual slide that I'll, I'll talk about that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push that to then if that's okay. But we do have a plan in place for that. And one thing, and as far as the phased approach or sub-phases, Phase five, where we have the treatment building. The treatment building is gonna take place in a couple different phases. One is gonna be the grading and preparation of the pad for the delivery of the treatment system, but that pad needs to cure. We need to run all of our lines to it. We need to connect everything with the exception of the prefabricated building that will be delivered later and put on top of that. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. So here's, here's what trenching looks like at Bay Ridge Park. The first thing I want to point out is that the majority of our trench is not directly in front of your driveways. We have done, we're trying to do our best to have it on the other side of the street so that, to answer your question, George, you can come in and out of your garage without having a problem. Now, there could be people working, there could be trucks and, and moving back and forth, and our construction crew and our community liaisons are very familiar with people coming in and out. They'll stop work, they'll guide you out. If there are certain sections, and there are sections where the trench will be in front of driveways, if you want to get out of your, let's say, you know, we send out notification and you forgot to move your car to a, you know, to the street or to a public, or to one of the uh, parking spots, it takes us about 10 minutes to drive a trench plate over and put it down to get you out. So it's not something like we can't, you, oh, sorry, we're working, you can't get out. They'll bring over the backhoe, they'll take the trench plate, they'll put it over and back you out. So yeah. it's not a problem. And the crew, yeah, the crew's very accommodating. If you come out and say, hey, I have to leave in 10, 15 minutes, they'll make sure it's placed within that time. Yeah, we, we are a well-oiled machine right now <laughs> based on what we've done at Bay Ridge Park. And so the two other pictures is at the end of the day, you can see on the left photo, we have the trench open and you can see the pipes been installed and we have the trench plates just to the side. At the end of the day, they place those trench plates over the open trench so that you can drive over them. The trench plates are, they're, they're not slippery. They're, they have a little bit of grain to them. So um, if you're walking on them, you likely not slip on them. Um, the one thing I do wanna point out um, is that this is a construction area. Um, and so there is gonna be dirt and there are gonna be marks from, from the backhoe and from the forklift and things that we use out there. Um, at the end of the day, they do 
hand sweeping, which is probably the most effective way to get everything up. But I, I do want to warn you that it is a construction site. It is, there is heavy machinery. Um, it is one of the cleaner construction sites you'll ever see. Um, but we do take measures outside of street sweeping by hand. Um, at, at given periods of time, usually at the end of each phase, we will have an industrial sweet sweeper, like the ones you see that spray water and have the big twirly brushes on them. We'll have those come through to make a run. So, and they will do, they'll do more than one phase while they're at it. Go ahead, look, and can you give them a mic? Oh, sure. I don't know that it's on. Thank you. Mike, at the end of the construction, uh, are the roads going to be resurfaced? Yeah. So the entire area that we are working and trenching in will be repaved. And by repaved, I mean two inches of the asphalt will be removed and repaved. So the entire road will be repaved. In addition to that, to match the color, because you don't want to just at the ends of each of those trenches, you don't want to turn from nice black new trench or uh, road to gray. We will re-slurry the back end, the area that we're not impacting so everything color matches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other picture you see here is a well vault. The well vaults, I think, are a little bit smaller. They're smaller. They're smaller than what you're seeing here. Yeah. This is what's going to be in the road that will connect to the well that's in the landscaped areas. All right. Um, and so follow up on your question. We have a temporary asphalt restoration. As you can see here, that's what it's going to look like. Again, this is after some cleaning, so you, you can see the stains of, of the tires of the, of the vehicle, things like that. Um, we'll do our best to, to get those clean. Um, but again, fully repaved, and then any landscape, uh, landscaping will be restored, and we're working closely with Carla to ensure that it meets her satisfaction. All right, so a couple things on this slide. So here, so the green 12-inch SBE well box, that's the well. That's the vertical well that extracts the system. Then there's a well box on the outside which connects to the larger trenching system, which then ultimately feeds to the treatment system, which is the vacuum that pulls out the vapors. This procedure is in flux with the HOA. Before, we were going to horizontally drill underneath the sidewalk, but now we are having discussions of removing sections of the sidewalk and replacing them. Um, for efficiency reasons as well as you would get a new sidewalk in certain sections. So we're not exactly sure how this is going to play out, but I just want to tell you that we presented horizontal drilling in the notice of work and in this presentation. But there is discussion of moving, removing sections. And you can see with the sections, they're about six to seven feet long. So that section would be removed. We would trench through, or we would, we would trench and then connect, make our connection to the well and then replace the concrete to look like that. Yeah, and Mike, that's my question. Sure. Because having done cement work, it's hard to match cement color to cement color. Yep. So what's the safeguard? Who, where's the sign off to make sure that the pigmentation is as close as possible to existing cement? So it won't be exact, um, but it will, it'll just look newer, which is good, but it does look different. And you can walk, or we did a site walk yesterday, um, and there are newer sections of the pavement, and you can see where they change. And so we, work, we will work with our contractor. What they'll do is they will do test sections back at their yard, and they will try to manipulate the surface to match as best they can. I cannot commit to a perfect match, but we will take measures to make it as close as we can. But if you walk around the neighborhood, you can see that's new, that's not new, that kind of thing. Does the HOA have the ability to be part of that participation to sign off? They are directly participating okay. right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just so everybody's aware, um, Belcourt Master owns the streets and the gutter. So the point in this picture, the point that Belcourt Terrace owns is up to the red curb. So the sidewalk and the landscaped area. Belcourt Master owns the rest, and we're, we're in direct communications with them. We have a memorandum of understanding, which is our access agreement that we're working with them, and they're being very cooperative as well. <clears throat> Before anybody says anything, this is not the building you're getting. <laughs> it's just an example, just to show how we're going to place it. So this building, it, there's a rendering coming up, and it's over there. 
is going to be a really nice building. It's being prefabricated in Minnesota. So all of the components within that are being built already, and then it'll be delivered on a truck and put down on the pad that we lay uh, prefabricated. There will be some architectural enhancements that we'll need to do. There'll be the connections that we need to do. But we, again, we're working directly with the HOA and their preferred architect to come up with this design. So the rendering that you see in the next slide and on the poster board over there is what it's been agreed, agreed to. Um, the grading, that's a little bigger than it's going to look. Um, I'll show you. So on the left is the existing area where the treatment system is going to go. And what you see on the right is a rendering of what the treatment system will look like. The light pole will stay. We just didn't have it in front of it because we wanted to show you a better view of, of, the, of the treatment building. But a three gabled treatment building that matches the roofing, the exterior material, the colors. Everything has been worked out with the HOA. Uh, their landscape architect was used to design to determine what um, vegetation will be placed around it and behind it. There'll be some additional trees to help s make it blend in. Um, so that is that is the treatment building itself. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to turn it over to Emily to talk about a typical construction workday. And I think I want to preface this by saying one of the things that we've done, and we'll talk more about the communication outreach process, is. Emily is our community liaison. So she is not only one of the lead engineers, she's the community liaison. And her purpose there is to interact with the community so that our field crews, Dong and Natalie, can focus on the work in hand and the construction crews so that if people have questions, they have somebody that can directly talk to. So I'll give you an example. We had some tree removal over yesterday at the HOA. Apparently, the tree removal people, they, they a little bit of sawdust got on their patio. I called Emily. She walked right over. Within 30 minutes, it was resolved kind of thing. And so we want to have somebody that's on site that, one, knows about the construction activities, design the system, and is able to interface with you to help resolve any potential issues you may have. Mm -hmm. So with that typical work day, because she's been there since November over at Bay Ridge Park. Yeah. So we're planning, we're going to be working every day, Monday through Friday, um, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The crew sometimes wraps up a little bit earlier than that. So um, 5 p.m. is our absolute cutoff, and 8 a.m. is our absolute start time. We ha will be meeting for our safety meeting before that, but no um, equipment will turn on until 8 a.m. And then the staff will vary from day to day. We'll have a couple of WSP people there, me and Natalie or Dong. Um, and then we will have the E&E &E crew, which is usually about four people. Uh, and then sometimes they'll have subcontractors, like the saw cutters, they have a crew of two or three. And then, so it'll vary from day to day. It's generally around five to eight people. Um, we will be mobilizing and demobilizing all the cones, all the equipment to our, our agreed upon lay down area every day. So there won't be any cones left out around the neighborhood. All the streets will be completely drivable at the end of every day uh, with the trench plates over them like you saw in the previous photo. And everything will be behind privacy screening in our little lay down area. It'll be a small little section over in the corner for us to just keep the equipment so that they don't have to bring trailers in every single day with, with the equipment on them. Um, we will have exclusion zones set up so that uh, it's clear to everyone where the pedestrian walkways are and, um, and the driving detours are. Most of the time there will be space for cars to get around, but if not, we'll have a flagger on either end to just like direct people around the other direction. Um, and advanced notifications, like we've mentioned, will be given to anyone whose garage is impacted on any given day. Uh, and I'll always be there. And uh, the our crew will be there if you need to get in and out quickly. If I'm not available at the time, like you can just go out and talk to them and they'll move things around for you, no problem. Um, some weather-wise, we, we will work still in, um, in rain if it's 
within reason. There are times that like an activity needs to be done where um, it doesn't make sense to do in rain, so we might have some days where we have to take breaks um, due to rain. We're starting to get out of the winter, so hopefully there's not too many of those, but um, we will let people know as it comes. And one of the main reasons we have to stop in rain, what shuts us down is when the trench is open and, the, and we don't have a way of diverting water out of the trench because we have to leave it accessible for people to drive over. And if the trench floods with water, it can compromise the integrity of the trench and then yeah. it can collapse. All right, so let's talk about communication. So I look at this as a four-tiered approach. Um, first, we have the community meeting today to provide you all information. We had a notice of work that went out. Um, it was mailed on January 19th. I think everybody got it in their mailboxes Monday or Tuesday. And it was also emailed out to everybody. If anybody is not received, if anybody in here has not received an email notification, please come up to us afterwards. We'll take your email address down and we'll add it to our key contact list. We work off of an email distribution list from the HOA property manager and we update it constantly. So if you want somebody else to be on it, you know, you're somebody's house sitting for a month, you want them on it, happy to accommodate. So that's the second approach. Here's the big one. This is the most important component to this after tonight is that you will receive weekly email updates. And we have been sending these out to Bay Ridge Park since November, and it'll have a description of who we are, why we're there, kind of a recap, and then it'll talk about the work that's been completed for that particular week, and then it will have a two-week look ahead. This is constructions and things change. We get ahead of schedule, like we got ahead of schedule yesterday on Bay Ridge Park, so we had to send an email saying, hey, you know, we're gonna be in phase three next week. Um, so those, for the detailed information, and it'll include figures, it'll include locations of the phases we're in, really rely on those emails to get detailed information. Then, during the trenching stays, so you, you all have been put on notice for the first two weeks of work. When we start the phased approach of trenching, that's when we get into a more defined area of communication. And what that will look like is a week in advance of that trenching week work, where they're coming out and removing that asphalt that's been saw cutting and they're starting to install the pipe, you will receive an email one week in advance. You will then receive 24 and 48 hours, should be 48 hour and then 24 hour phone calls from Michelle Rodriguez. You will get to know Michelle very well. She is our scheduler and she's our communication as far as phone goes. She will ask you on the 48 hour phone call, would you like to be reminded 24 hours? Because some people are like, I'm good, I know, I, I haven't forgotten, that kind of thing. And then you can opt out of the 24 hour. And then each morning, uh, Emily will go door to door just to knock to remind you that we're starting work in front of your house. I usually do that at the beginning of a phase when we're starting in front of new homes and then after a couple of days when everyone gets used to it, then um, I don't go around door to door as much just to not bother people. But if you would like me to remind you, um, I'll. I would be happy to accommodate. And Emily, how early do you knock on folks' doors? At 8 a.m. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and we realize that everybody has a different communication preference, and we will cater to your preference individually. Belcourt Terrace is a little easier than Bay Ridge Park. There's just not as many of you. There's not as many homes um, that we're dealing with, and the construction of Bay Ridge Park is very Tetris-like. Um, which can make things challenging, but it's, it's fairly straightforward with respect to the layout of your community. All right, so communication. Um, again, we have community liaison on site. There's her phone number. She will be on site. There'll be sandwich boards. There'll be notifications that go up visually everywhere that has her number on it. Feel free to reach out to her. I'm not gonna tell anybody who they can and cannot communicate with, but your best bet to get it resolved quickly is to deal with Emily. Many of you have my cell phone number. If you wanna call me, that's fine as well. I'm happy to jump in. Um, and then, so if you have questions regarding the specific SBE project, I recommend Emily or myself. If you have, um, or you can call the 833 number, which is a 24 hour number. Um, and then we also have the Ford Informational website, which has more information than you could ever imagine. Um, and then always there's Jessica Law with the water board. All right, so before I start talking about sub-slab depressurization, I wanna, I wanna mention that this is a contingency measure. 
Um, Sub-slab depressurizations is what we consider a short-term mitigation measure. Mitigation meaning it doesn't clean up the problem, it just mitigates the problem and eliminates a preferential pathway of those vapors into your home. And I want to give Bay Ridge Park as an example. Bay Ridge Park had 22 homes that we know of, those homes participating in the indoor air program, that had active vapor intrusion occurring. And so the process in getting the SVE launched was time consuming. COVID didn't do us any favors. Um, there was an appeal process with the permit that we needed to place the building. That added on another year. So Jessica, rightfully so, said, look, there's 22 homes that have air purifiers running, which are little units inside people's homes that clean the air. They're noisy. We have to come inside their home. We have to change out the filters. It's not a long-term solution. So Jessica required us at Bay Ridge Park to install SSD systems as to bridge that time from when the SVE system goes on. So Bay Ridge Park has 14 sub-slab depressurization systems on their homes. The idea is once we start up the system, the SVE system, that those will be removed, right? Because it's a much larger system pulling away. So when I talk about SSD with respect to your community, we do have to do a pilot test, right? We have to run a test to determine how we would design the system in the event that we need to install one of these as a short-term mitigation measure. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? And when engineered right in the way the SVE system is supposed to work, it is going to you know, address those shallower vapors, but the screen interval is deeper. So there is that potential for the um, for shallower, for, wait for that to go back on, for shallower uh, soil vapor to still be there. And so if that's the case, that's where we would add in, like, yes, you need to move forward with the sub-slab depressurization systems. There will be some um, additional sampling that they can do to confirm that the soil vapor extraction system is reaching below the foundation and that's one of the things we had asked for in the approval of of this work and so but just to make sure everything's in place that's where we're we're wanting that uh pilot test of the sub slab depressurization system yeah and so again this is a contingency um and so this just talks about the benefits of air purifiers which are a short-term mitigation measure versus SVE, which is long-term remediation, cleanup, removal of the contamination, and SSD as a contingency. Um, so we're gonna perform a pilot test at one home, um, and the pilot test only takes a day, and it's basically we drill below the foundation, we run a couple tests to see how, how much air we can extract from beneath the foundation, and then we run calculations to design a system. Um, Again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna leave these, these slides here for you. If you have questions related to SSD, I'm happy to answer them, but I do wanna show you a picture of what they look like. Now, these are at Bay Ridge Park. These are the actual systems. So this is basically from the bottom up, you have the extraction point, which has a 10-foot pipe that runs underneath the foundation, which extracts those vapors or creates a preferential pathway through a low vacuum to a carbon unit, which is the gray with the black on each end. That's the treatment of that air, of, the, of those chemicals, so that what we discharge at the rooftop is clean and meets AQMD standards. And then what you see in that square box, that's the fan, that's the blower, the extraction device that pulls the air. And then what we did at, at Bay Ridge Park is we concealed it with a fence. So again, this is a contingency. There is no plans right now to install any of these. If we were to have to install one of these, out of house, it would be a short-term mitigation measure. We would look at making enhancements to the extraction system, which can come in a variety of ways. We could turn up particular flow rates on particular wells closer to that house, downgrade, downflow some of the others. So again, this is just a contingency, but I, I have to show it to you, basically. Okay. Done, how'd I do? Okay. <laughs> All right, so questions and answers. And again, we have, we're recording, so I wanna make sure that if you have a question, raise your hand. Sarah or I will get you a microphone and um, we'll go from there. Uh, so Mike, yep. w you're with WSG? WSP. WS what does WSP stand for? It really doesn't stand for. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't stand 
Yeah, nobody knows. It's just three letters for a particular project that we have in Toronto at one time. So it stands. It means for. It means nothing. It does not mean anybody's name. It's it, no, it no acronym. Okay. William Sale Properties. Okay. So the the construction is going to start in February and go through June. Is that correct? Roughly, yes. Roughly. Mm -hmm. And that that's when you're going to officially turn on this underground vacuum. Correct. And how long is it going to be on for? Great question. So um, we have. Or how long do you anticipate it's going to yeah, be? Yeah, we on anticipate for? the mo the majority of remediation to occur within the first year. Um, ideally, we would turn the system off within a year. What occurs when you're removing vapors? With a system like this and again these are somewhat low concentrations of vapors um, what's going to happen is we are if you're looking at a graph like a what we call a concentration trend graph you're going to see the higher concentrations as soon as soon as we turn that system off they're going to drop quickly within the first couple months and we're going to reach an acetonic you mean, you mean as soon as you turn it on it's turn it on did drop. i say off yeah my bad as soon as we turn it on you're going to see those concentrations because we test air, all the soil gas probes around there. We test all the locations while the system's running, and we, we produce that data in a, in a graphical format. You're going to see those concentrations drop very quickly. But what we'll reach is what's called an acetonic stage, where no matter how much we pull on it, we're really not going to be pulling that much mass of chemical. And so what we do is go into what's called a pulsing phase. And I'll let the smart people in the room talk about pulsing. and in all of this because they're the engineers. But basically what that does is when you turn off the system, it's a rebounding effect where those chemicals that are adhering to those soil particles will release themselves and enter those gaps within the soil. And then we sneak up on them, we turn it back on, and we pull them back out. So you go into a pulsing mode. And that pulsing will be determined as we see the, the data come in. right? So we could come back out after six months or seven months and start a pulsing phase where we might turn it on for a week let it run, turn it off for a week or a month, turn it back on. So there will be some sort of likely pulsing method, but you, once the system's turned on, you're not going to notice us turning it on and off. You're going to see us show up and... So you're going to turn it on for a year, then you're going to shut it off, then you're going to pulse it for six months or God knows how long? Or? Yeah, the idea is, is the agreement that we have right now is two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to have steel plates over this no. trench for two years? No, no. As soon as we get to that June, yeah. all of the roads are refinished and repaved, and all that you're seeing on the surface of the, of the roadway are the well vaults and the, and the um, tra condensation traps. Yeah. yeah. You're just going like to see stuff the on the surface at, at, at grade level. And so after two years, when you have determined this is finished, we get regulatory buy-off from Jessica? to shut down the system and remove the you're, system. So you're going to remove that, that plant, but that uh, vacuum cleaner box, yep. right? Yep. And then you're going to retrench the ground and remove these uh, pipes that you've drilled into the ground. And yeah. Are you going to refill? Like you've got all these 45 foot deep yeah. holes in the ground. Are you going to backfill those holes? At some point, those can be abandoned. Um, it's We have to figure out the specifics of that once we get closer to that stage. So what, um, what's the name of the paving company that's going to repave our road? You said they're going to take they're going to take the whole width, the whole street, and go two inches, and then... Curb to curb. Curb to curb. Mm -hmm. Or gutter to gutter, I should say. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I know what you mean. But yep. uh, so two inches, they're going to grind it down, they're going to repave, and they're going to slurry coat over that. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you're getting, but, a, but they're going to leave brand new after road. two years. They're just going to leave all those pipes in the ground, and that's to be determined. Yeah, at some point they will be removed, but it'll be determined when. At some point, so you're going to have to repave the road again. We would probably come back and just repave those particular sections. And well, then, then it's going to look horrible. Begin. <laughs> you're just going to, you're going to have uh, those there are ways lines to abandon in place, but we haven't gotten to. It would almost be better if you that. just patched it for the time being and then yeah. repaved the whole thing after two years at the very end, right? I mean. There's often times also where like with the um, remediation systems, that, that trenching lines, they leave them in place and sometimes they will just pressure grout it and that's in compliance with well standards, California well standards to um, slurry them in place so that they don't have to retrench and they will do that also to abandon wells. Sometimes they'll completely over drill it, but other times they will put in a 
like a bentonite or a neat cement slurry, slurry. And typically, if it's since these are above groundwater, it would be neat cement so that there's not new preferential pathways are cracking with the bentonite slurry to abandon. So that way, they don't, they're not just an open hole below the ground that um, future contamination can migrate through or. Or settling. Or, or yeah, yeah, any settling mm -hmm. or anything like that. And so, Mike, the name of the paving company is? Are we going to be using City Paving? Or do we have city a paving? contractor with them? I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. It's City Paving? City our paving our subcontractor, E&E, e &E manages all of their subcontractors, so they procure Sounds them. confusing. E&E yeah. e is? E&E &E is our primary is, sub. Yeah. And they're our contractor. And then underneath them, they have different subs, which one of them would be the paving company. Okay. Over at Bay Ridge Park, we're using City Paving, which was their actual preferred paving So company. this is going to go by my property. I would tell you, I, I would rather have you patch the trench and then after you're all done then repave it nice because uh, if you're if you're just gonna go back in at a later time and dig these out and then just fill in the what's the point of that I mean or do it do it properly twice so I don't I don't think we have the answer tonight but the point is well taken and um, I think two things Mike you're gonna have to think about that and we're gonna have more meetings so we'll let you know and then just one moment, please. And the second thing is you can certainly get the name of the paving contractor that you'll be yeah, using. And we can work with the phase. HOA to use a preferred paving company. Mm -hmm. OK. Yes? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask me, how many people actually want to have questions? And maybe I'll just number you. So we have one here, and then you. And anybody else? OK, well, I can remember, too. So we'll <laughs> use you first, and then we'll go to this gentleman. Where's the? Uh, the people that are going to be on site working, where are they going to be parking? Good question. So they will, are we still carpooling in for the most part? They, they come together and the only vehicles that will be there on site will be a necessity, right? So if they're using a truck to transport goods, if they're that, so on and so forth, they usually come together. Maybe Emily can speak on this a little bit more. Yeah, they usually have two trucks and they keep them in the work zone for the most part. Um, and then we we can do whatever is needed. I will probably just ride my bike over from you know a nearby parking lot, or I could just park near our laydown area. Um, we can accommodate however needed between the WSP people, and then. Thank right. you. Note that. Love Please that. Trace <laughs> right there, get her address. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we the main cars that are there are the crew, and it's usually two trucks. Yeah, yeah, while you're going to see equipment, you're not going to see a bunch of personal vehicles show up and start taking up all your spots. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, Mike, in regards to the earlier question, was a great question. I didn't realize that the process involved going back in and possibly disturbing the asphalt a second time. Mm -hmm. So I would really hope that it would be put back the way it was after July. And then again, when two years later, if you go back in and you disturb the asphalt, the reason is, as people look at Belcourt to buy into mm -hmm. and, and to, uh, into our project, the last thing for the next two years, I think any of us want, is for people to look at a, a, you know, a quilt work on our streets when others look nicer. Yep. And so I think your project would impact our comps. Sure. So I would really encourage you to do it the right way in the beginning, and then if you need to, unless you mitigate it like you talked about, I get it. But otherwise, I think you need to do it correctly. Sure. Fair question. And so just so everybody's clear, the picture on the left is what it would look like for two years. Not right, not right now, not the, only if you didn't go plan. back and Yeah, and that's not the plan. No, it, sorry, no. your plan. Is that's what very, if, that's if, very if, unclear. Yeah, sorry. If we were to wait the two years to re-asphalt, it would look like that you for two years. Twice. Yeah. Oh, twice. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to recap. The expectation that I'm hearing is you want to see this out in June when the work is done, and you want it curb to curb, and you want to see this when the system is actually dismantled, however that is done, the expectation is it's going to look as nice as that. Okay, okay. got the comment. Sorry, yeah, that makes sense, and that is a conversation that I can have with, very importantly, Belfort Master. 
they own the streets and my client, of course. But it is a fair question and f fair concern. It impacts, <laughs> not only does it impact our comps, it impacts Belcourt Masters comps too. Yeah. I mean, so we're all integrated. And so therefore, it needs to be done correctly because I don't think you guys want to impact our comps. Yeah. Fair question. Thank you. Yeah. And I, you know, I would just say, working on a lot of these projects, I think Ford has gone, they have tried really hard to make this project work and make this as least as unimpactful as possible, recognizing it's going to impact you. So comment taken, and we will report back on what happens. Uh, so you said you were gonna. Um, put, you said you were gonna put your equipment away every day. Yes. Where is that going to be? Yeah, and I know that you live right at that corner, and so I can walk over afterwards if you want. I can show you that. Let me. Let me get. You might not be able to see it that clearly. Where are we? Hold on. You just be right there. So down in the bottom left you'll see a treatment construction laydown area. Right now that shows it wrapping around the corner, but based on the site walk and at the request of the HOA, we are gonna push that back a little bit more so that if you're coming down, uh, if you're coming south, it's gonna be pushed back a little bit and not in that corner. I have no idea. I have no idea when you're talking. You I know. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. So you're gonna put all the equipment right there outside yeah the side yeah every day <laughs> can you put it down where it kind of goes in and so it's not out into the street there's a little area that is yeah, that's, a that's little about, where, like, you, you guys were set up there the other day under a tree like a tree <laughs> And on well, the yeah, it's on the other side. The street. Okay. It will be on part of the street. But well, we thank you. Clearance. I wouldn't have thought of that. Okay. Um, other questions or comments? I have one more question. Okay, so Mike, after two years, we repaved the, pro the street again. And then we're all done, right? We're done with this. We're done with WSP. We're we're sailing off into the sunset, and you're right on to another project. And I mean, I'm looking at Jessica, and she's oh. on this for seven years, and she's like banging her head against the wall. This she's ready to move on to another project, huh? No way. Um, so the are we done after two years? Are we finally done? I mean, this has been this has been going on for decades. Yeah, and that's one of the can I. Chlorinated solvents do not clean up easily, and they are fairly persistent in in their existence just by their chemical makeup. And so when the cleanup is done, we don't just walk away. Plus, this project is bigger than just Belcourt Terrace, Bay Ridge Park. It extends both south of One Ford Road, because it recall, you know, One Ford Road was the former uh, facility. And so the impacted groundwater, impacted soil vapor extends to the south of that and then north almost down to here. And so it is a large area that we are uh, overseeing the monitoring, active cleanup in certain areas. And then because there's lower concentrations, it's more of a passive cleanup, um, which is the monitored natural attenuation. And so that's what's going on with groundwater and in some areas soil vapor and so after the active cleanup of soil vapor extraction is done there'll be some ongoing monitoring and then in other areas active cleanup is going to be following behind them but just in a different area so it won't be as present um, this will in the two years once the active cleanup is done um, especially with this construction things will return back to more of a normal, kind of how it was before we identified the need to evaluate the vapor intrusion. 
Okay, but but I, I just want to recap. So yep. in two years, though, you'll largely be done in Belcourt yes. Terrace, except for you'll be having to do regular yeah. monitoring. But yeah. remember, what, what's happening now is actually permanent removal of the problem on site there. And it's going to speed things up versus the waiting and allowing just a slow decline um, of concentrations over time. And so... It just won't receive regulatory closure in two years, but the um, heavy amount of activity will be greatly reduced. Okay. I have a question over here. Uh, I'd like to know, in regards to disclosure that the homeowners have to give uh, in the case of maybe selling their sure. house or, or different things, who would we refer them to talk to because we can't satisfy all the disclosure because we we don't know it yeah and and we need somebody to refer to if we were to sell our house and who would that be yep excellent question so there's a couple things so ford's stance on disclosure as as far as physically providing something is if your home is in the indoor air sampling program and and many of you are that letter that you get with the results that explain what results are inside your home, that is what they recommend disclosing. I know that might not be enough for everybody, but we, ref we ask people to refer to their real estate agent or a real estate attorney to determine what needs to be disclosed. But on top of that, I have talked to many a real estate agent um, for prospective buyers and sellers. I'm happy to walk them through Same. the process. Jessica as well, I, I probably talk I mean, Terry Hardke, I know her well. Um, I know all of them, all of the big sellers in, in One Ford Road, Bay Ridge Park, Belcourt Terrace. So happy to talk to them, happy to talk to um, the buyer, the seller, whoever, to give them more information, steer them in the direction of more information so they can make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, back there, Sarah. Thank you. At the end of the two years when we're completely clear. What happens to this rendered uh, building? I think currently in the MOU, which is the memora Memorandum of Understanding, we have the HOA, we give them the option to keep it if they want or we'll remove it completely and return the landscaped area to pre-existing conditions, if not better. So it'll either be removed. If they so choose to keep it, they can have it. And we would remove the equipment at that point so that it could be used for whatever else. Other questions? Okay. Who would represent us, the homeowners, about pursuing the two times of keeping our neighborhood street uh, in, in great order instead of looking at that patch trim for two years? Because that, that's going to kill us. So just to clarify, you wouldn't be looking at the patched approach for two years. We, we will be re-asphalting everything in June or July, that time frame when we, when we uh, activate the treatment system. I think their question was, if we were to decommission the system and come back to remove that trenching or just the wells, that you would then have damage done to that and it would be discolorization. So I think the request is, after the removal of everything, come back and do it again. To answer your question, it would be the HOA representatives communicating with me. I take that back. Uh, usually, I take that back to Ford or their two legal departments work together. Once legal gets involved, and both HOAs have attorneys. Once the attorneys get the information they need, they work together and they cut. They cut me out, basically for a reason. Did I, did I misunderstand when you showed the patch yes. that th that wasn't going to stay looking like that for two years? And, and you're I added to that confusion, I think, in my comment. So okay, that's the one. That's not yeah. going to remain for two years. Okay. Once we're done with a particular phase, like phase one, we come back and hot patch it temporarily until we're done with the system, June or July. We turn the system on. Once we say everything's working great, we come in and repave the whole community. Well, the area that we are working within the trench. Then we re slurry everything. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. Okay, I, we're clear. All right. 
Other thoughts or questions? Okay. So just want to close by thanking everybody for coming. I realize this is an inconvenience. I realize this is a burden. I wouldn't want it in my neighborhood. I know it's in your neighborhood. I want to thank you in advance for your cooperation. We will work with you. I have an amazing team um, of people on this project, and they're all very dedicated to this project. It is a construction site. We'll work with you, but please be patient with us, um, and we'll do our best. And what, what our best is, is is pretty darn good. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.